Alright. Um, I'm gonna share the screen as well. So, as I've told you guys, like, yesterday or something like that, today I'm gonna talk about, like, <clears throat> how I learn English in general and I'm gonna answer some of you guys questions about the way I learn English and how I like approach English on a daily basis stuff like that okay so let me just put that on the presentation mode you know what like before the class like 10 minutes I remember I have to finish the slides and then I have to finish that as fast as possible so yeah okay so here is the table of contents like what I'm gonna talk about in today's presentation or whatever that is so the first one is my language journey like basically I'm gonna tell you about how I learned English when I was in the third grade and moving on to when I am in the ninth grade right now and then I'm gonna tell you guys how I improve the four skills in English which are reading writing speaking and listening and then how I study vocabulary because I think vocabulary is like the foundation for every single skill and the more vocabulary you know the more likely you would improve the four skills and then some questions that you might have for my English learning stuff oh so my journey so let me just tell you guys like my story of learning English and how I like learn English how, how I self-study it and how I study that at school so contrary to the common belief I, I I think that many people here may think that I learned English when I was like in kindergartens or when I was like four or five years old or something like that but in fact I started learning English pretty late when I was in third grade um, I started learning English along with my peers in classroom like the third grade and then at that time I was first introduced in English and you know what I was just completely amazed with how how fascinating English was and I was just hooked on learning English right from the moment that I learned the first letter in English because I just don't know for some reasons I mean like English opened up a new world for me and it just basically opened up a new perspectives into the world of like knowledge because like English is the international language right and you can use English to get access to a lot of resources to the knowledge that are available online because a lot of like academic journals and scientific studies are written by top experts in English. So that with that in mind, and at that time I was really curious about another language. So I invested a lot of time in English, but I didn't really take English seriously at that time. Even though I was really interested, I mean, English is my favorite subject, was my favorite subject at school, but I did not really spend that much time learning English. I just finished English homework at school and then at home. I didn't really care about that because at that time, I didn't have a clear mindset or a clear vision. What, why I learned, like what is the reason I learned English for? So I just finished the homework and that was it. I didn't self-study, I didn't explore the contents i didn't self-study or anything but then fast forward until the sixth grade when i first entered secondary school um, at that time there was an english club in my school and i participated in that because english was my own was my own was well, the only subject that i was interested in and i really liked i mean english besides like mathematics i do, i don't really like mathematics or something like that so i joined in english the club english and um so i had to actually immerse myself in the english language as much as possible in order to get prepared for that competition so at that time i realized that i have to learn english just merely to pass the exam i didn't really think that english would literally change my world uh, later on so basically after that competition, I started realize something about English, which was that when I actually learn English, I can read more into... So, let me just tell you guys this. So basically, um, my favorite series of all time, if you don't know yet, w it, it is like Harry Potter and at that time, I was reading the Harry Potter series in Vietnamese. I didn't know that it is... Uh, the, like the original the original books are in english so i just read the um, harry potter series in vietnamese and then at that time when i was just basically serving on the internet i just stumbled upon a post that uh, like kind of like purchase or like it, it 
it is like telling like the Harry Potter series in English are on sale, and I realized that the in the Harry Potter series, which are my favorite series in the entire world, I love Harry Potter a lot. Like I reread the books multiple times. Like I lost count of it. But basically, anyway, so um, I stumbled upon that, and I realized that I really want to read the original text, and I decided to learn English in order to help me to read the original Harry Potter's books. And I think that is just a really, like, the reason why got me into English and got me started on the English learning journey. And from that moment, I started taking English more seriously with an aim of actually achieving my goal of reading the um, Harry Potter uh, series in English. But then, when I was learning English to reading that series, I realized that English was... Much more than that, because when I learn English, I can read news, I can consume English content. English opened up so many more opportunities for me that were unthinkable to me before. I were able to understand people that I really admire in English, and I'm able to consume contents in English as well. So that just really, really fueled my passion for learning English, and I decided that English is gonna be. Something that I would like to conquer. English is the language, and is the thing that I would like to accomplish. And I decided to commit to learning English for a very long time until now. Okay, so that is just my journey. You see, I didn't really learn English from a young age. Neither of my parents actually know English, like know anything about English, or like there's nobody guide me to guide me. I just basically based my own learning. Uh, my own English interest on the series of Harry Potter, and then I just myself realized how uh, learning English is so crucial, and it opened up so many new chances for me to explore the world, to get to know new cultures, get to know new experiences and perspectives, and just learn English. There's nobody to guide me except for the teachers at school, of course. Like English is a compulsory subject, but when I was at home, nobody guided me. I didn't attend any extra classes. Or I just like because like the curiosity just lead me to learn English and lead me to learn English as a tool to explore the world and to open up my new horizon, to read Harry Potter series, and to know more about Taylor Swift because I am a fan of Taylor Swift. I really love listening to Taylor Swift when I was like in the fourth grade. Um, so English, like I love English from the small little things, from the things that were really. That that were really relatable and attached to me, and from that my love for English just grew. So I think that is really crucial because you have to identify what you like in English, and that really motivate you to learn English. I I know a lot of my peers actually, like, a lot of my peers treat English as a kind of like compulsory subject. It was really intimidating. It was really hard, and they ended up not making progress because they don't know why. What is the reason they have to learn English for, right? So you have to identify why you have to learn English, and what is the reason you think English is necessary for your own futures. You can just not learn English because your peers learn English, and like all of your classmates and everybody around you is learning English, and you really, really want to impress your peers, and you decided to learn English. Like no, you have to know the reason from from your internal, internal um motivation. Why you have to learn English? Maybe because um, you want to learn more about your some some topics that interest you in English. Maybe because you like Taylor Swift like me, and you want to learn more about her life, about the um, the process that she produced her songs, or maybe because you want to read some books that you really want to read in English. So just identify why you want to learn English and start from there. So yeah, that's uh, my journey of learning English, and. Um, Any questions so far? Like anything that you want me to answer relating to that, my journey, whatever the questions are. Okay, I, I guess there's no questions, so I'm gonna move on to the next part. Okay, so the next part, which I'm gonna talk about, how I learned the four skills and how I like started from the moment I started taking English seriously, how. 
I learn English. Okay, like um for e- each individual skill. Let's start with the speaking. So I have two tips. Not tips. I think it's not tips. Actually, it's like two ways that I approach speaking. So the first one, maybe it's bad news for you guys, but there's no shortcuts to speaking. Okay. So a lot of people tell me that my speaking is my speaking ability is so great. Like they want to learn about how I improve speaking and the tips that I apply. But honestly, I don't have any tips. Like I don't have any tips. I just practice a lot. I just turn speaking into a part of my daily routine and I speak whenever I can. So sometimes it's embarrassing to admit, but I speak a lot to myself, to my own self. Like whenever I'm alone, like there's nobody around me, I speak to myself. Or whenever I am like outside, when I'm walking, for example, I I speak to myself. And I notice a lot of people just stares at me like I'm some kind of weirdo, but I don't care because like, I don't really care about others' opinions about me. I just care about whether or not I actually improve my speaking ability and that is all that matters to me. But anyway, so I'm not talking about how embarrassing it is to speaking like in front of the in front of the when you're outside. I'm talking about you have to practice a lot and turn speaking into your daily routine that you do every single day. You cannot live without it. I'm gonna talk about this later more in this um slice, in the following slides. But there's no shortcuts to speaking. The only way that helps you to improve speaking is known other than actually s- open your mouth and speak. You cannot just expect to like, uh, learn, have some like, magical pills to improve your speaking within a night or weeks or even months. Speaking is a lifelong process that requires determination, persistence, and commitment to cultivate and to accumulate the experiences to practice every single day. So you have to turn that into a lifelong commitment and basically practice a lot would help you to advance in speaking so you will make progress the more effort you put into doing it and now if you just keep practicing and you do not have the right strategy or you do not have the uh, appropriate approach to speaking you will also not gonna make progress so that is when constructive feedback comes into handy i think that in the speaking proportion or in any active skills, which I think is speaking and writing, constructive feedback is really, really important because you'll know your mistakes, you'll know what you're doing wrong at, and you wanna improve later on. Like you wanna, you wanna like, the next time you will not repeat the same mistakes again, and you're gonna make progress. But if you keep practicing and you do not know what you're doing wrong at, then you're just gonna, you're just gonna at that level and you're not gonna elevating to another level so constructive feedback is really important you can um, ask for feedback after a conversation like between your friends your um, teachers whatever um, the person is as long as the person is experienced in English so just ask for the feedback and what you're doing wrong at what do they think about the pronunci- your pronunciations your way of expressing yourself how you use the vocabulary whether or not your word choices is suitable or not and just go from there so yeah um and oh i forget to actually kind of like incorporate that into the slides but i think that i also incorporate one very important technique for speaking which is shadowing so you may have heard about that or you may not have heard about that but i'm just going to explain what shadowing means so shadowing is basically you mimic you kind of like repeat and you 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 mimic the way that the native speakers speak in an audio for example you watch an english content or an english video and then you mimic the way that the speaker express himself or herself in the video and you will after a long period of time doing that you will subconsciously absorb the way that they express and they speak and you would adopt a more native like accent so i think shadowing is a really cool technique i actually have been putting that into use a couple of weeks ago and i can see that it's really effective like i don't know but i I just see that i can make huge there's a huge difference between my accents before and after i shadowing for a period of time so you can actually put that into use and see whether or not it works for you but i think that the 
two most important techniques practice a lot and constructive feedback for speaking and then we have the writing proportion which i think is like uh, well to be honest with you i am terrified with writing like i just don't know but whereas like for the three other skills which are like listening and reading and um and speaking i'm able to like that come really naturally to me but when it comes to writing i'm struggling a lot like i don't know how to organize my ideas how to use academic vocabulary i just don't know and i ended up really sucking at writing but then i realized that the reason the root cause why i am so like where writing is my weakness is because i don't put enough time into it i don't like spend much time into writing and i ended up just basically uh, doing really bad at it and terribly writing <laughs> like i write s- my, my writing sucks so much that i even like avoid writing as much as possible like, whenever people ask me to write a letter or an email or whatever that is i just avoid that i don't want to write but but then i think that but then um just a couple of like months ago i decided to improve my writing skills because i think that there's nothing that is impossible that i can actually improve writing if i want to do that and so i set goals for myself that each day i'm gonna spend 15 to 10 minutes every single day i'm gonna sit down at my desk i'm gonna open my notebook and i'm gonna start writing something it doesn't matter what it is it can be about a topic that i think that is kind of like worth writing about it can be about what i'm gonna do uh, what i'm gonna do um the next day maybe about total list about journaling or diaries whatever that is but as long as you actually sit down and write something so what i'm trying to say here is that turn writing into a part of your daily routine and incorporate that into your schedule so i don't require you to sit down and write like an essay within an hour or like hours for hours i don't really need you to do that just need to sit down on the desk and then spend like 15 to 10 minutes write something so um the ideal way of doing that is with is like writing physically with pen and a piece of paper but if you do not have that tools you can type on your like laptop or whatever the device you're using but i would suggest you sit down and use a pen and a piece of paper to write down like write anything you want okay because just turn that into your daily routine and after like 10 and 15 minutes of writing that you can advance the amount of time you spend for writing each day like you can write 30 minutes and you can also increase the difficulty of the materials or the things that you write like for example if you write about what you're doing like you'll write a short paragraph within like a few weeks and if you want to make some changes you can write about like you can write an essay or essays about a complicated matter or or a like academic matter so just write about anything and turn that into your daily routine that is really really important i'm telling you so yeah turn that into your daily routine write anything you want journaling diary blogging reading summaries essays if you want i don't really like force you to write an essay because i know that essays are of the most like challenging part of writing but if you want to write something academically and if you want to make progress the most effectively than just writing um, academically a little bit more write essays write or if you're like at a really advanced level you can even write like research paper even though i know that not many you can do that like it requires a lot of effort a lot of research and you know you know you have to know how to cite resources how to find the appropriate newspaper materials to write a perfect research paper without any mistakes so yeah that's that but for now just focus on 10 to 15 minutes per day writing diaries and journaling and the next tip i noticed for writing that i think i don't know whether or not it is a tip but i noticed that the more you read the more you can actually improve your writing like i just don't know but i noticed that until recently i started reading more english books and then i realized that i'm able like writing comes to me like naturally like ideas just flow from my head like water and it just can 
immediately like type or write things down really really seamlessly like i don't know but i think that the more you actually read you can able to you'll be able to absorb and to take in how the authors express his or her ideas how they formulate sentences how they use like certain words to describe their stories their um life experiences etc so for example let's come back to our example of harry potter so i cannot tell you guys how many times i have read harry potter and how many times i watched the movies as well but for the sake of this particular uh, particular um skill i'm just going to talk about the books i'm going to talk about watching movies later in the listening proportion so for the reading books i actually i realized i noticed something that kind of ridiculous which is that I s- my writing sound a little bit more like jk rowling like, i don't know okay maybe this is just i am being delusional or something like that but i don't know i think that i sound a little bit more like jk J. rowling until recently um so yeah i think that because i read harry potter so much that jk rowling has a lasting impact on my writing and like she literally influences my writing and my writing styles so i think that the more you expose yourself to different authors to the author that you like the more likely you want to adopt their writing styles and start writing just like them like just so just to put that into practice just to try that just um read so first let's start with some uh the same authors first you want to start with for example jk rowling you want to finish reading her seven books and let's see whether or not you actually sound more like jk rowling but for me i think i sound kind of like that after reading harry potter multiple times so that is just something that i noticed i don't know whether or not it is actually like scientifically proven or it is actually valid to use but that is just from my personal experience that the more you read the more you can improve in your writing do you know there's a quote actually i heard somewhere on the internet which is um a great writer is wait a good reader is a good writer or something like that or it is like a good writer is a good reader or a good reader is a good writer but whatever the um whatever the side is but i think that writing and reading just really relating to each other so yeah and um next slice i'm gonna talk about reading reading is honestly my favorite skill my favorite like aspect of learning english may- many of you guys may may me one may make me guess that may assume that i like speaking the most because maybe you think that my speaking is impressive or whatever you are my thinking you might be thinking at that moment but for me i love reading the most just because i like reading books and so reading english becomes something that i can most endure with that i th- i find reading english really enjoyable and pleasurable so um anyway let's talk about how i read or how i improve my reading in the first place first widen your vocabulary So as I've said like I think from the get go of this presentation vocabulary is the cornerstone for four skills like the more vocabulary you know you can automatically improve the four skills as well it's not only reading but the more vocabulary you know you can express yourself more you can understand the paragraphs or the contents that you consume more so just basically focus on widening your vocabulary as much as possible So even native speakers encounter vocabulary all the time. Like vocabulary is inevitable and you cannot avoid that. You will know uh, you will like face with new vocabulary every single day and every single time you open up a new content there's going to be some new vocabulary you don't know. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to tell you guys how I actually learn vocabulary later on but basically just focus on uh whenever you encounter vocabulary just make a habit of writing that down and you can look it up later and you have to store that and you have most importantly you have to use the vocabulary in order to make that into your active vocabulary which I'm going to also explain later in the vocabulary section but basically when you learn vocabulary you have to use that you cannot just learn that and then you just throw it away you do not do anything with it 
Okay, so you have to do that like when you're speaking, when you're writing, to turn that into your active vocabulary, which basically the vocabulary that you are able to retrieve from your memory and use whenever you want. Whereas passive vocabulary is a vocabulary that you only know the meaning, but you don't necessarily know. You don't necessarily pull that into use when you're speaking or when you're writing. So yeah, just use vocabulary, use new vocabulary. To know how to use that into context, and the next thing I want to talk about writing—I'm uh, sorry, reading—is read thoroughly. Uh, read thoroughly. Don't skim and scan. So if you're learning IELTS, chances are you already have heard about skimming and scanning, which basically is a method that help you to get the meaning of the text or get the general idea of the text quicker and easier. So, but to me, I don't think that skimming and scanning actually works out in reality for me. Like in paper, like I heard so many anecdotal stories of people, um, report that skimming and scanning is really effective. It works out really well, but to me, for some reasons, I don't know. Skimming and scanning don't work for me, and yeah. So people said that just read the first sentence of each paragraph and the. Final sentence of each paragraph, and you wanna automatically have like a general idea, a general picture of what the paragraph is about. But to me, it's not the case. I just cannot understand what how people are able to grasp the entire text just by skimming and scanning, and they are able to secure such a perfect score in the reading proportion. So maybe it it works for you, and if it's work for you, then just keep doing that. But for me, it's not. Okay, it's, it's just I just cannot really understand the the method and the process behind skimming and scanning and how people can actually use that so perfectly and so flawlessly, and how they can able to achieve such a high score just with skimming and scanning. But it's just not working for me. So I decided to follow the conventional method, which is to read thoroughly, read every single sentence, read from cover to cover without missing anything. And I think that works out so well for me, much better than skimming and scanning, because when you're reading thoroughly, you would understand every single sentence of the authors, and you would you are able to understand the paragraph and the essays much more thoroughly, and more in depth. Because when you're just skimming and scanning, you want to miss out some important details that are mentioned. For example, in the middle of the paragraph, or in some other corners that you might not know. So when you read thoroughly, you will notice something that may that the others may not just by skimming and scanning. So read reading thoroughly and just basically taking in the um, way that the authors express his or her ideas, I think help me more in answering answering the questions in the IELTS proportion. So yeah, I think that's that. Just read thoroughly. Read, don't like rush the process. Just read th- reading thoroughly. Nobody force you to read. Like of course, like in the IELTS exam, there's gonna be some like time limit for the reading proportion and for other proportion as well. But if you're just reading leisurely, then just reading thoroughly. Just read slowly, and just absorb every single thing that you can read. Like don't rush the pos- process. I want you to realize the art of reading and the beauty of reading thoroughly. So yeah, that's that. Maybe I I sound kind of ridiculous right now, but. Reading thoroughly just really helps, and there's even some like scientific ev- scientific evidence that if you read slowly, you're able to grasp the hidden meanings of the passage more, much more bet, much better than the person who just reads really quickly and reads like finish the whole passage with within just a few minutes. So just read thoroughly and don't skim and scan. All right, and for the next skill, I think the last one, which is listening. So I have also two tips. Um, the first one is consume English contents, which I think that I pretty much emphasize throughout the entire presentation quite a lot. But basically, consume English contents. Um, yeah. So just basically consume whatever you enjoy, or you feel like you wanna do in English. Like for example, you may. I I really like listening to podcasts. Uh, do you know like the Anything Goes of Emma Chamberlain, which I'm gonna, t- I'm gonna like, I don't know whether or not you can see the screen, but I'm just gonna tell you guys this. Emma Chamberlain is like my favorite 
a podcaster. I guess there's maybe there's no word for podcaster, but yeah, Emma Chamberlain is my favorite podcast program, and I just love that a lot. Um, yeah, so you can actually try listening to Anything Goes of Emma Chamberlain on Spotify or on Apple Podcast, whatever means you're listening your podcast from. But listening to podcast is my favorite method of listening. And wh- whereas, and at the same time, enjoying the content that I am taking in. But if you don't like listening to podcast, which sometimes can be intimidating because it's a very very long discussion of people talking to each other, and of going to depth about the matter, you can also consume YouTube content, which are more visual and more vivid, and more, um, and a little bit shorter, and more like, basically YouTube con videos utilize the images to hook the audiences. So if you don't just want to like playlist listen to something you can uh, watch youtube contents and videos or you can even watch movies as well which i think is my absolute favorite way of listening english and of actually getting a peek into how a natural conversation with native speakers is gonna be played out so yeah watching movies and podcasts and youtube videos Um, and then the passive listening and active listening. Okay, so I've actually heard a lot about this about passive listening and active listening. So passive listening basically means that you play the English content on the background when you're doing something else. For example, when you're doing the housework chores, when you're running errands, when you're washing the dishes, you play the music. Uh, I'm mean, not the music. You play the English audio on the background. You don't necessarily have to concentrate on. Like understanding one hundred percent what the audio is all about, but you just basically familiarize yourself with the uh, listening materials. So I don't know whether it works, but when I actually put that into experiment with my mom, who is also learning English right now, and I decided to tell my mom to try this out. She says that it's kind of work for her because, like, whenever she's, for example, she's like uh, sweeping the floors, for example, she's kind of playing some. English content or even some English, some English musics on the background, and she, she tell me that she are able to, kind of like familiarize and get her ears, get accustomed to the way that English sounds, which I think works out perfectly well for beginners because it helps you to get to know and your ears, kind of like sound, more natural to the English materials. But I think it doesn't work that well for advanced learners. I think that what you should do as an advanced learner in English is to listening actively, consuming deliberately the content, and concentrate on understanding every single word in that listening material. That is active listening. That you just put one hundred percent of your effort and your attention and your concentration. In comprehending the materials at hand, so I think that active listening is much more effective than passive learning. Passive listening, but like, if you're a beginner or if you're new to English, then I think a passive listening can, to some extent, works out for you. But I would highly encourage you to listening actively, that you concentrate on listening. And on doing one thing at hands, t o o multitasking, like just listening passively, and then doing house chores. Because what if you actually get distracted and you end up like listening to the audios, and you forget completely about the matter or the task that you're doing at hand? So I think that you should not multitask like that, and just focus on only listening at one time and just focus on that. So that's my opinions about the four skills. Um, sorry about that. Um, in English, so first, I'm just gonna summarize and sum up all the points I've made by getting you to read the slides one more time. The first one is speaking, so practice a lot and constructive feedback. You can take a screenshot or write things down if you want, but yeah. So practice a lot and constructive feedback, and then uh, writing, which um, turn writing into a part of your daily life, and read more. Which I think is really personal because I don't know whether or not people feel the same way about writing. Like, if you read more, you can actually improve your writing. But yeah, so that is the two 
techniques I use for writing. Uh, somebody raises their hand or something. Oh, oh no. Sorry about that. Okay. Anyway, so um, reading, which is widen the vocabulary scope and read thoroughly. Read in details. Re don't rush the process. Just enjoy the art of reading. Don't scheme and skim. And listening, which is to consume English content, what you enjoy, and passive learning versus active listening. You can actually, you can actually put that into practice right after this, after this um presentation of mine. Like for example, just, just play the English content on the background when you're doing something else, and see whether or not after some time whether or not you actually improve your listening, versus when you're listening. Uh, when you're listening without any distractions, without anything on your mind, and like you just focus your heart and your soul into listening, which one is more effective? But I think that active listening has more potentials. Okay, so before I move on to the next section of the presentation, any questions so far? Oh, I know. All right. Okay, so I've just had this idea. Actually, like I think that maybe some of the parents might join this class, and I mean, if I just speak English, they would not be able to understand, right? So I think that I'm gonna actually after finish like delivering the presentation in English, I'm gonna actually give the presentation one more time in Vietnamese. Yeah. I think that's how I'm gonna do after this. Anyway, so um, I'm gonna explain the last concept of today's presentation, which is about how I analyze an article. It's not necessarily an article; it can be any English content. But for this example, I'm gonna tell you guys how I analyze an article and how I retrieve the vocabulary that I encountered when I'm reading that article and. How I write things down, how I look up the vocabulary, how I pu uh, put that into my long-term memory, and how I'm, I am able to pull that whenever I want to use it. Okay, so for this, I'm gonna actually take an example from a news, uh, from an like article website, which is the Guardian. Maybe you have heard about that. The Guardian is a really good website for you to improve your academic academic reading because it utilizes a lot of cool expressions in academic settings of reading English that I think is kind of cool to actually get to know that so after this you can try reading some articles in English on the Guardians because I think that if you want to get like read some news in English then just read the articles I mean the Guardians or you can read the National Geographic which I really love reading magazines about, but I'm just gonna tell that more. Um, so basically, I'm just gonna. I think I'm gonna stop sharing the screen. I'm gonna show you guys the articles, and I'm gonna tell you how I analyze that. Wait me a sec. Okay, so for example, I'm gonna take the Guardian as an example. Of course, you can actually read like any any news articles, website, whatever, to your preferred choices. Like it, it is not restricted to only the Guardians. You can read CNN, you can read NBC, you can you can read National Geographic, you can read whatever you want as long as it is in English. But for the sake of this video, I'm gonna just take the example of the Guardian. All right, so immediately just pops into my eyes when I click on this is some headlines like some of the most noteworthy news of the day but I'm not really interested in the politics so I'm just not gonna read that so let me just choose some news that actually excite me about the environment okay so in case you don't know I really love learning about the climate change and the environmental problems and about biology in particular. So yeah, I'm just gonna choose some news about the, the environment to take as an example. 
policy um pollution abandoned pipelines pipelines could release poisons into north sea scientists warn so let's just take that okay This article is not too long, so I think it's going to be a perfect example. So I'm going to read out loud, and I'm going to highlight whatever like new words I encounter along the way. And then I'm going to tell you guys what we're going to do after that. So, abandoned pipelines could release poisons into North Sea, scientists warn. Researchers say toxic chemicals pose a pollution risk as oil and gas companies are allowed to leave pipelines to rot. Decaying oil and gas pipelines left to fall apart in the North Sea could release large volumes of poisons such as mercury, radioactive lead, and polonium-210, notorious for its part in the poisoning of Russian defector Alexander Litvinenko, scientists are warning. Mercury, an extremely toxic element, occurs naturally in oil and gas. It sticks to the inside of pipelines and builds up over time, being released into the sea when the pipeline corrodes. Some methymercury, the most toxic form of metal, is released by the pipelines, although other forms can be converted into it. The International Minit Minimata Convention on Mercury states that high levels in dolphins, whales, and seals can lead to reproductive failure, behavioral changes, and even death. Seabirds and large predatory fish, such as tuna and swordfish, are also particularly vulnerable. So far, there's no new vocabulary, um, so let's continue reading. Liam Payton, a researcher from the Institute for Analytical analytical chemistry at the University of Graz, who has raised the alarm over the mercury, mercury pollution. Okay, so this is not necessarily like new vocabulary, but I think this expression is kind of cool. Raise the alarm. So I'm just going to highlight that, just uh, for paying attention later. Told the Guardian and watershed investigations that even a small increase in mercury levels in the sea will have a traumatic impact on the animals at the top of the food web. There are about 27,000 kilometers of gas pipelines in the North Sea, and scientists predict the amount of the metal in the sea could increase anywhere from 3% up to 160% from existing levels. In some countries, such as Australia, companies are required to remove them when the oil well stops operating. But in the North Sea, companies are allowed to leave them to rot away. Wait, why there's no vocabulary? Because normally when I'm reading The Guardian News, I encounter so many new vocabulary, but for some reasons, I don't see anything here, but let, let me just basically take a look through this and see. Okay, I think I'm just going to read in silence because that way I'm going to read more faster. So yeah, you can read along if you want, but just wait me for a few minutes. And I'm going to highlight any keywords. I mean, not keywords. I'm going to highlight any new vocabulary along the way. So yeah, you can read along if you want. Oh here, oh here, partition. So there's a new one for me. This is not a new vocabulary, but the phrasal verb is kind of cool, so I'm going to just highlight that. Here, pernic- pernic- I don't know, I don't know the pronunciation of it. Pernicious, maybe pernicious. I'm just going to highlight that. Hmm. 
decommissioned. Oh, I don't know that word. So I'm just gonna highlight that. Meeting is obligations. Okay, so you can see that actually there's a lot of decommissioning mentioned here. So I think this is a particularly noteworthy vocabulary. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna change the color of this word because this one appears quite a lot in an article. And whenever I encounter a new word, and especially if it encounters a lot throughout the entire uh, article, that is the sign that this vocabulary is worth noticing more than the other so I'm just gonna color um, I'm, I'm gonna use another color to highlight so I'm gonna use for example um, yellow okay so let's just continue reading it oh which part I am at oh here Okay, oh, I'll finish that. So, um, throughout the entire passage, uh, we have... Um, I'm gonna like rule out the, the collocations and the noteworthy, new, I mean, noteworthy phrasal verbs. Just take into account the vocabulary. We have three of them. Three of them. Alright, so that is how I'm gonna do, which is that whenever I am reading this, I'm gonna highlight the vocabulary or whatever thing that I think is interesting in this article, some expressions that I think is is cool throughout the entire article, I'm gonna highlight that. So that is the first step. What about the second step, which is um, highlight words? Okay, so the next step I'm gonna do is, is that I'm gonna have to guess the meaning of the new word first based in the context because I believe that learning new words based in the context would help you to memorize the new words uh, much better than just you encounter the new words and you immediately look it up like there's no context adding into that so if you actually put the word into context then it's be so much easier to memorize that because you're able to Whenever you like remember the new word, you're gonna link that into a particular context that you have actually put that before. So it's much easier to recall the new words as long as and also use the and know how to use the word, like when to use the word, what context you can actually use that word and not use word like you know unser unceremoniously. So so for example, the mercury is more likely to partition between the sediments, water, biota, and atmosphere, adding to the global mercury cycle. So, partition. Actually, I remember that I've actually like met this word before, but I don't remember the meaning of it. Like for real, I I do see that before. Like it sounds so familiar, but let me just guess. Okay, maybe the guess turns out to be completely. <laughs> Um, the guess may, may be like completely contradictory to the meaning of it, or maybe it's kind of true, but whatever the guess is, just guess, okay? So, for example, based on this context, I would guess that the partition means... Um, I mean, maybe it means like erode or something? Like maybe, for example, maybe it means to 
dissolve. Yeah, I mean, it means like to actually dissolve and to dissipate. Like, I don't know how to describe that, but that is my guess, which means to dissolve. I'm just gonna write down the key, the word here, and yeah, I'm gonna look it up later. And then we have pernicious, pernicious. So Okay, so based on this context, I think it's pretty clear to me that pernicious means um, something that is negative, definitely. So maybe I'm going to take a synonym of this word, maybe, um, what is the word? Oh, so just, I'm just going to take like for example, malicious, I don't know. Yeah, it means like, it's really dangerous, it's really perilous so like that so that is the word pernicious and then we have decommission so for example let's just read this particular sentence it is hard to predict what would happen especially in the long term if large amounts of mercury trapped in the decommission pipelines were released into the environment okay so i think maybe decommission means like um run down maybe i don't know it means like it's really old, like it is out of condition. So yeah, that's that's my guess. Okay, so after that, it is the time to look up the new word. So I'm gonna look up this par partition first on the dictionary. So let me just wait. Can you guys actually see? Um, Wait, wait, let me just stop sharing. I'm not sharing. Wait me a minute. Okay, so after that, I'm gonna go to the dictionary. So choose, like, an, um, what is, what is the word? Choose a credible and a reliable dictionary source. There's tons of dictionary websites out there, but two of the most uh, trustworthy dictionaries I would encourage you to use is Cambridge Dictionary and Oxford Dictionary. Two of them are like well established and has a really clear meaning attached to each word. And also example sentences for you to see how the word is used in context as well. So f um, for the word, I've just, I've just, um, encounter this is partition so before clicking on the word i have a, a, like, a kind of like a disclaimer for you so the guess might be completely different from the real meaning or it might to some extent kind of like true to that but you should not feel discouraged if like the guess is different from yours I mean, the meaning is different from yours because it's completely normal, but at least you actually put extra effort into learning the vocabulary by guessing the meanings of it first before looking it up. So here it is. Partition. Oh, it's not a noun because in this case, if you actually look at the, um, like for example, if you actually look at this, you see that partition here. So just based on the grammatical structure of it, mercury is more likely to after two is a verb, so partition in this case cannot be a noun. That is one way for you to identify the the form of the vocabulary and choose the most accurate meaning in this case. Okay, so let's come back to our dictionary website. Here it is. Partition. Verb to divide one part of a room from another with a thin wall. It's not that to define a country into separate areas of government. So basically, it kind of like means to divide, right? Whatever the context is, but it means to divide. Let's see whether or not it actually fits the description of uh, this particular sentence. So, the mercury is more likely to partition between the sediments, water, biota, and atmosphere, adding to the global mercury cycle. Oh, so I think it might actually fit here, even though I do not really get the meaning of it at first. But I think, let me just explain what I think about this. So basically it means like mercury is going to divide between these different elements, like sediments and water and biota and stuff like that. And it's going to contribute to the 
uh, the amount of mercury uh, globally. So that is how it goes. But let's see whether or not we actually see anything else besides the verb meaning of this word. Because there might be something else. Maybe this this. To divide something t into more or two or more parts. So yeah, in general, it means to divide. Okay, so let me just see. This so okay, so wait, wait, wait. So you see that the meaning turns out to completely different. Like it has nothing to do with my guess. But that's okay because at least I I learn I've learned something new and like it is so you know that mystics tend to actually stick more no, no, no. Actually, you're able to remember your mistakes much better. So, even make the impression that you're guessing it wrong, and then the meaning turns out to be completely different, then you're able to memorize that, because the next time when you encounter this word. So, you might actually remember the word dissolve, but then you realize that, you remember that you actually look it up, and it is actually to divide. So, you're are more likely to remember this word, and you'll not repeat the same mistakes. So, yeah, I'm just gonna make, make like, write a note on this, and I'm gonna uh, sum up all the new words into my notebook later on, after this lesson. So basically, partition in this case means to divide. Alright, and then we have pernicious. So let me just, let me just go to this, and I'm gonna look up the word pernicious. Now that, oh wait. One thing I've just, I'm almost forgot to tell you guys, which is that you also have not only learn the meaning of it, but also learn the pronunciation of it as well. So I'm gonna open like the, I'm gonna play the pronunciation part and see. Partition. I'm always kind of loud. Oh wait, so partition. So my guess is true. Anyway, so the word is pernicious. Here it is. So it is having a very harmful effect or influence. It is exactly what I think the word is supposed to be. So you see, my guess is true. Malicious is gonna have the same meaning as having a harmful effect. If you don't believe me, then I'm just gonna put that here. Here. I'm intended to cause harm. This is an this is especially, but this is not apply for all the case. So intending to cause harm basically means like harmful. It's really adverse, stuff like that. So, yeah. So that is malicious. Anyway, so pernicious. 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 And then you can actually read this. The read this example for further context. The cuts in government funding have had a pernicious effect on local health services. And one thing that I want you to remember when you're learning vocabulary is that you also have to learn like a fixated or like a commonly used collocation that go along with this word. For example, pernicious often go with, you know, have a pernicious effect, which means have a very harmful, a very malicious impact on something. So... That is how I learn new words. I learn it with phrases, with commonly used um, collocations that I can pull out to use every single time I remember the word. I can use that within a particular phrases. So yeah, I'm just gonna go to this website again. I'm gonna write down the have a, mo have a pernicious, pernicious effect effect on so yeah that's that and then we have decommission so I'm gonna come back to this I'm just gonna go back and forth between the web sign and the dictionary and look up every single word learn the pronunciation of it learn the meaning of it and learn the example of it so this word is decommission Okay. To take equipment or weapons out of use. Wait a minute. Let me just see whether or not it actually fits into this. It is hard to predict what would happen, especially in the long term, if large amounts of mercury trapped in the decommissioned pipelines were released 
in the environment. I don't really get the meaning of this. Decommissioned. Why is it related to weapons? Well, let me see if there is any other, other like meanings or definitions. To officially take a factory or other industrial building out of use and make the area safe. Hmm. Maybe that's that. Let me just return back to this. Oh, uh, wait, wait. I'm not showing the screen, right? Here. Um, decommission. Yeah, I, I think it might have this, that meaning because the meaning about like the weapons cannot fit here. Like it does not have anything to do with weapons. We're talking about mercury and the effects of it on the environment, right? So it cannot like there's no way it's going to be related to to weapons. So I think it's our op only option. So it doesn't mean run down. My guess is wrong. It means um to take off well let me just think of a word that is more more suitable um to pull down yeah to pull down a plan to ensure safety for others that's that um yeah so of course it might you might like feel like the meaning of it might feel odd in the first time the first time you encounter that but the more you actually familiarize yourself with the word the more likely you're gonna make sense of the word and i think that i'm just gonna actually go to the internet and i'm gonna see like how people use decommission like in real life, like how are you gonna do that? So, I'm just gonna type the word decommission, and there's gonna be tons of example. Here, make a nuclear reactor or weapon inoperative and dismantle <coughs> and decontaminate it to make it safe. So, for example, go to like. Wait, normally it's gonna have the news news um tab here but i don't see that here but anyway so basically after reading another definition from another website i have a better idea about that which means to make like a nuclear reactor here or like some sort of plan inoperative or dismantle that to ensure the safety of a particular you know um to make it safe and to make the surrounding environment safe so that's that Mm -hmm. Alright, so that kind of makes sense to me now. So I'm gonna stop sharing this. Wait, let me just... Where is that? Oh, here it is. So you see that that is how I look up the new words. It might feel like a lot of work. It might feel like you have to put a lot of effort into it and it might feel like it might even take me hours because i remember that there's one time i read an article and there's tons of new words like each paragraph there's like five or six new words and then i have to like spend one and a half hour to just look up all of them and then write things down and then practice using that by writing a summary of that so yeah it takes a lot of work but the thing is that the more effort you put into something, the more likely you're going to remember that in the long term. So because I put a lot of effort into sticking and into committing those new words into my memory, I am more likely to recall that later on. So that is how I am studying new words. Yeah. So I'm going to return back to my slice. Oh, and after that, after looking up the new words, one the end of the step is to write things down but i'm not gonna do that because i cannot show you guys how i'm writing 
uh, like how I write things down because it's obvious everybody know how to write new words, right? You write down the new word, the word form of it, whether or not it is a verb, a noun, or an adjective. Then you write the meaning of it. You can actually rephrase the meaning, like paraphrase the meaning of it in your own words if you even want to make that more personal to you. So then. Or you can just basically copy down the meaning from the dictionary. You write an example, so you can copy an example from the material that you encounter the new words. Like in this case, I'm gonna write down the examples, f- the sentence that have the word in my notebook, and then I'm gonna write down any additional phrases, collocations, or any fixated phrases that often go along with this word. Like the example of this pernicious, right? We have have a pernicious effect on. And then the next step, the next step is to actually summarize the entire article or whatever resource you are actually reading into a short summary using the new words you've just learned and you've just actually required acquired. So that is how I learn new words. It's really intimidating. It's really time consuming, but it's also really effective as well. Okay, so let me just return back to my slides. But I think that's pretty much everything today. Um, yeah. Wait, wait. Let me just. Okay. So just to summarize that, and if you want to take a screenshot of it, then just go ahead. How we analyze an article. There is there are four steps to follow. The first one is read is read multiple times. Actually, you don't necessarily have to read multiple times. But if the article is too incomprehensible, or if it's too complex, or too abstract, that it require. It might require you to actually read it multiple times to get the meaning of it. Then just go ahead and read multiple times. Don't worry. It doesn't mean that you are stupid or you are e- you are like dumb or something. It just means that you have more time to actually understand the oracle more thoroughly and more in depth. And then the next step is when you're reading. Actually, this step is. When you're reading this article, you highlight the keywords. Oh, and by the way, if you're wondering what the highlighting, highlighting um tool I'm using when I'm reading this article, then I'm just gonna show you guys that. Uh, I'm just gonna go back to this. So basically, I'm using this website or this extension from Google Chrome. Um, this web highlights PDF, like. Basically, just go to the Google extension and then type in the word highlights. There's gonna be like a lot of options for you to choose from, but I particularly like this because it has multiple colors for me and it also have a space for me to actually write some notes along the way. So you can use that. Let me just tell you. Let me just uh, show you guys, like how many things I got. So as you can see, on this I highlights a lot. Like not every single day, but I highlight a lot, like on, like this month, I like oh, around five articles. Actually, it's not like every single time I would write down new words, because I just only write words that I think is particularly relevant and practical to me. That I think I'm gonna be able to use that every single time. Like I'm not gonna learn technical new words like this word, methy mercury. Like this word, I'm. I really gonna use that in my real life conversations or in my writing because that is too technical and too specialized. Unless you are specialized in you know learning about chemistry or you're gonna become a scientist, you have to learn these words. But for me, it's it's not relevant, so I'm not gonna learn that. So it really depends on w- the the popularity of the word and whether or not I'm not I'm gonna use that in my long term usage. But basically, I highlight a lot. Like from different resources, you can see that. So yeah, um, that's that. This is called Web Highlighter. I'm just gonna. May I don't know I know ah. Sorry for that. Um, so I'm gonna type like the website in case you're wondering or you wanna download that. Yeah, I think that's that. I think that's pretty much. Anything I want to talk about today? Anyway, so um, to sum up, Wait, let me just share the slides again. Okay, so first, the next step is to highlight words and to make a guess based on the context of it, and then look them up in the dictionary. Choose some dictionary that is, like, that is reliable and that is official from like 
top universities like Oxford or Cambridge, stuff like that, and then put them into use. That is, I think that is probably the most important step of learning new words, which is you have to use that. If if you learn new words and you don't put that into practice, you don't use that. Then it's gonna fall into the passive vocabulary, which means you know the meaning, but you don't necessarily pull that into use, or you don't necessarily like use that or remember that. Remember to use that when you're having a conversation or when you're writing an essay. So you have to put them into use to, well, stick that to your long-term memory. So that's pretty much everything I'm gonna share in this presentation. I think it's pretty much a really long one, like an hour over an hour actually, according to my recording timer here. But yeah. So the last part is any question. Oh, actually, like I remember when my mom actually posted, like, me having a meeting tomorrow on her Facebook account. There's one question from, from someone I don't remember the name, but wait, let me just take the question from this. I actually put that here. I'm gonna share with all of you. Um. Um, I have a question. Oh, yes, go ahead. Um, so it's about like writing. Do you make a draft when uh, before you write? Oh, yes, um, it depends a lot. <clears throat> so for example, if I write an essay, I would make a draft. But if I write something that is more like that is more informal, like diaries or something like that I don't write draft draft. So it really depends on which type of writing that I am currently dealing with. So, for example, if it is a really academic style of writing, like an essay, a research paper, I'm gonna make a draft. Of course, it is important to make an outline and to list down like every single point that you wanna make on that particular essay, and you make a draft of it, and then you have to proofread it. You have to like um, rule out any possible mistakes, like that is really silly, like grammar mistakes, and you have to write the um, the main essay review out based on that draft. Um, does it make sense or should I? Oh, uh, so usually how long does it take you to write a draft? Um, well, again, it really depends on the type of question. Now, if, um, the essay prompt is actually something that I do not have too much knowledge about, I would have to do research and it, it's going to take me a lot of time to do research, to read all the newspaper, the papers and, you know, gather all the resources and materials that necessary for me to actually write that particular essay. So um, for that particular uh, essay prompt that is more complicated and out of my knowledge, I'm going to have to do more research. And of course, my draft is going to take more. But if the essay is something that I can relate to or something that I actually have a pretty much general knowledge about, then the draft is not going to take long. It's going to take around like 15 to 20 minutes for me. Okay, um, does it make sense or any more questions? Okay. Um, somebody raises their hands. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, what's methylmercury? Methylmercury? Okay. So basically, I don't know because as I've told you earlier, I don't bother looking it up because it's some kind of like technical term. But if you're wondering, then I'm just gonna look it up for you I think it's some kind of like chemical element or something I don't know but let me stop sharing this and I'm gonna I'll paste that here okay so in case you're wondering this is a meth methylmercury I don't even know that I have pronounced that correctly or or not but yeah just assume yeah. that I do pronounce that correctly so methylmercury is an organometallic corrugation with a formula. What is that? I don't know. Okay. It is the simplest organomercury compound. Methylmercury is extremely toxic. So it is extremely toxic. And its deri derivatives are the major source of organic mercury for humans. It is a bioaccumulative environmental toxic with a 50 day half life. So one thing that I've learned from this, only one thing from this definition is that it is really toxic. So yeah, there we go.
Um, you can actually do more research. Okay. Do more research about that if you want. But honestly, I don't. Yeah. Ew. Um. Yeah. So that's that. Okay. Um. Do you have any more questions? Thanks. Okay. Any more questions before I end the classroom? So I'm gonna send the slides if you want to read more about that. But that is basically how I learned English in general and my language journey and yeah. Oh, and about the question that somebody asked me on the Facebook post. I have to actually ask my mom about that because I don't know where it is. Okay, uh, so I've just asked my mom about that and the question from Mui Hai Nguyen. Uh, so basically she asked me, can I ask what app do you use to practice speaking English fluently? And can you show me how to manage my time effectively? What books do to read to help me practice English? And what book that help you write new English words? I hope you answer because I have a lot of questions. Okay, so first off, thank you for your question. Um, so I don't use any app to practice my English, but I remember that a couple of like when it was in the sixth grade or seventh grade i don't remember it's a long time ago i did use elsa speak to practice my pronunciation elsa speak um do you know that i think that you do know that but elsa speak like actually my mom purchased like some kind of account for me and then uh i learned pronunciation with ai on that but i think it's a very cool app like it helps to identify which part I am pronoun I am mispronouncing, and then the sample like answers of it to help me practice is kind of really relevant and really cool too. So that is the only app I use to practice speaking English. And besides that, I do not use anything. Like I just speak with myself the majority of time. And can you show how to manage my time effectively? Um, I'm not necessarily an expert in time management, but if but if you're asking this, then I would say that in order to manage your time more effectively, you would have to make a to-do list, like write things down and to organize that, to make a timetable for you, and you have to stick to it. You have to be disciplined with yourself. That is the core thing of managing your time effectively, which is to be disciplined and to stick to commit to your timetable. Yeah, I think that's that. I, I don't have general many tips for time management because I'm not really good at it. I procrastinate a lot. I am, um, yeah, so, but I'm, I'm trying to actually stop procrastinating and becoming more punctual and getting, meeting my deadlines on time. So the only way that I do that is to make a timetable and to write the total list. What books to read to help? me practice english so it really depends it is a really personal question like it depends on your tastes on your like what you like to read on your favorite genre but uh so personally i love reading thrillers and i love reading fan fantasy and reading you know books like harry potter's i don't know the genre of it but basically i love reading uh, thrillers and horror stories it's just really based on your personal preferences but if you're new to English, I would recommend you reading Harry Potter, because I think that our intermediate can read that. And you can read like the Land of Story series, which is my favorite series of the entire world, besides Harry Potter. Like this, um, here's the cover of it, in case you're wondering. Wait, let me just... I want to like illuminate the background so I can show you guys this. But basically, the Land of Stories. It's kind of like share some similarities with Harry Potter. It's follow like two twins into the magical world of the fairy tales, and it is like the adaptation of the of the fairy tales. But it's so creative and so captivating. I mean, like it's so cool. And um, the series has six books. I'm gonna show you guys, but I I don't know how to like turn off the. I don't know if you can see that, like, oh here it is, so here is the land of stories, I'm sorry if the images are blurry, but basically I'm gonna, t uh, I'm gonna type the book on the chat box, the land of stories, 
like it is so life changing and the letter of stories it's just like really similar to Harry Potter and that's the reason why I like it and uh, if you like thrillers like me you can read well honest, honest I don't really suggest you reading it because it has some really explicit and brutal scenes there it involves like killing and murdering and homicide so I don't really recommend you reading what I am about to recommend you but I think that you should read like the Land of Stories and Harry Potter. What um yeah, I think it's that. What book that helped you write new English words? I don't understand your question. Like, what book that helped you write new English words? I don't really understand what that's supposed to mean. So, I think I'm not gonna an- answer that. But basically, I would like to sum up my answer for your question, which is first um the app that I use, the only app that I use when it was. Uh, in sixth grade is uh, Elsa speak and how to manage your time. I think that you should like make a timetable and a to do list. And then the books that I suggest you to read is Harry Potter and the Land of Stories. So yeah, if there's no more question, I think I can end the class. Oh yeah, somebody raises the hands. Go ahead. With uh, the- I still have only one more question. Yeah. So the question is, how do you organize your information when you're writing? Huh, that is a really good one because I am struggling with that a lot. Like, uh, some of, I actually like learn, study like. No, one of my teacher actually told me that I am really suck at like organizing ideas. Like my ideas are just really tangled up. Like it's really confusing for the readers to grasp what I'm t- trying to deliver. So I'm really trying to actually improving on that. But based on my personal experience, I would say that you have to be concise you you only like you don't need to use like lengthy words or explain too much about your ideas just explain that within like a few sentences and just basically follow like these formulas for writing a paragraph first start with a topic sentence and then uh and then pre- proceed with like some exam I, I mean some explanations for your topic sentence and then some examples that is how I st- construct like I structure my paragraph, but I am struggling a lot, so I don't have any like particular tips for that. But I would say that you have to be concise and don't just overcomplicate things. Yeah. So does that make sense, or should I? Okay. Cool. Um. So any more questions? Alright, um, f- so if there's no question, then I'm gonna end this presentation. And I'm really looking forward to my speaking class, which gonna start like on what? On, I don't know, um, on next month or something. But uh, yeah, so basically it's gonna start very soon, maybe next week or the next of next week um so but yeah and for those who do not get selected don't be discouraged because well in any kind of a sort of class selection you there's gonna be some people who got who not gonna like get the chances of studying and don't feel discouraged of that okay because it is by no means an indication that you're stupid that you're not worthy of my class but because i'm i'm only to like choose only 10 students so it's a really tough decision for me for some people there but don't feel like you're like stupid or you're not good at english and not being chosen means that you're not good at english it's absolutely not because there's still room for improvement right and the class the space of class is only like for 10 students so even though you do not get chosen don't worry because I'm gonna, I'm gonna like open a few more classes in the future and maybe you get the opportunity to study with me too so don't worry about that yeah so um i think that it's pretty much kind of long and thank you so much for your participation i'm gonna see you in the next maybe the next um presentation if i got the time so uh, bye have a nice sunday bye teacher bye bye